Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Calls Calls. This is the 2024 Valero Texas Open DFS Tactics Show. Got a great show for you all. All of the last minute information you need to optimize and dominate. This week in DFS for the Valero Texas Open, we have all the updated ownerships, uh, the, the updated forecasts, projected ownerships, all of that good stuff, plus uh, my rankings and all of the metrics that we think are going to play best this week at the Oaks course. Got a lot to get into. Let's get into it. All statistics provided tonight and every night are from FantasyNational.com. It is the best golf analytics tool out there for your money. It's going to make you a much smarter golf gambler and a much better golf DFS player. Go check out FantasyNational.com. You will not regret it. In the description to the video, there are links to all of the social media. First off, my X and Instagram, where earlier this week, I posted some research around the pre, uh, previous nine winners of the Valero Texas Open at the Oaks course and the patterns that they had leading into their win at the Oaks course and the players this week who fit that pattern as well. So if you want to see the weekly research that I do on the PGA Tour, give me a follow at your preferred social media site. X is also where I place my weekly betting cards and my top player usage in the DFS contests I play. Uh, that'll come out later this evening after the DFS Tactics show here on Calls Calls. So if you want to see those pieces of information, give me a follow over at X. And then lastly, for social media, Gabe's handle is in the description. He writes a very good article called The Fringe. It's a great way to start your week of preparation, and he continues to update you throughout the week with his own version of course form or course history, recent form. Uh, and if you are a subscriber to his article, which is free to do, by the way, you're going to be able to join us in his Substack chat as we continue the DFS conversation over in his Substack chat. He's gracious enough, gracious enough to host me over there. Uh, we talk about game theory, our favorite uh, players at portions in the price board, our favorite areas of the price board in general, what we think uh, is going to be the optimal play, stars and scrubs, balance the mix, all of that. So you don't want to miss out on the great conversation and discussion that goes on over there after Calls Calls. And the only way you're going to be able to join us is, again, if you are a subscriber to his article, it is free to do. So go show him some support. Follow him over on social media and subscribe to that article. Lastly, we are live. Chat is open. Want to hear from you all. In addition to the poll question, which I'll put out uh, as soon as we're done with the intro here, I want to hear from you on that. I want to hear who your winner is this week at the Valero Texas Open. Who are you pivoting to, fading away from? What kind of lineups are you building? If you have any questions, uh, obviously put those in chat. I'll be more than happy to give you uh, my perspective of what I see this week for the Valero Texas Open in, in that regard as well. So let's figure out our strategies and our tactics for the 2024 Valero Texas Open. And we start over at the Super Forecast over at Windfinder. And before we do that, I'll let you get a, a quick look at Thursday there. But the poll question for this evening has... Uh, a lot to do with um, with the narratives that you're going to hear quite a bit throughout the weekend or week and weekend, especially on the broadcast, which is about the Masters. So the poll question this evening, how much are you using players who are already qualified to play the Masters? Are you using them a lot? You're not scared. You're using them a decent amount, not avoiding, but not necessarily looking to target them a little or not at all. So let me post that in the chat. Would love to hear your uh, take on that. Uh, Want to hear what the community is thinking in that regard. We look at the forecast for San Antonio. Thursday looks pretty calm, although we do. it does look like we get a little bit of some gusts early on or maybe later in the morning or early afternoon and then kind of tapers off and then Friday the wind really picks up but I want you to notice something Friday morning the gusts are extremely high close to 30 miles an hour in the morning whereas the sustained winds are pretty calm you know anywhere in the high single digits whereas in the afternoon 
The sustained wind picks up, but the gusts supposedly drop. Again, I'm only going by what the forecast has. Uh, that's all we can do. So when I give you this recommendation that I, or how I'm playing it, keep that in mind. I'm always going to suggest that if you have the ability to stay up late, get the next um, forecast update, which is generally around 11.30 Eastern or so, or if you have the uh, ability to uh, wake up early, the luxury to wake up early and get the updated forecast then, uh, I'm going to suggest you do so. But if this is the last wind forecast that you have before you finalize your lineups, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach than what you might think. I'm going with a favor of the Thursday morning, Friday afternoon wave. Let me tell you why. Yes, Friday afternoon, it looks like they have the highest sustained winds among the cut. But the difference for me is if you've played golf before and if you're expecting the wind to do one thing if it's blowing 10 miles an hour like it says here and you catch a gust it's going to throw off everything about what you're doing and these greens are difficult to hit enough as is and we'll see that when i go into the mixed condition model how much i've factored around the green in and whatnot i do not like seeing 20 plus mile an hour differences between gusts and sustained winds that is very very unpredictable if a player catches a gust there's nothing they can do think about the players from a couple of years ago when you know you had players hitting seven irons into or um, trying to hit seven irons onto the seven or on the 17th at the island green at sawgrass uh, the most vivid thing I can remember or vivid player I can remember is Brooks as soon as he hit he just laughed because he caught a gust and the ball didn't make it but maybe three quarters of the way to the green wind gusts play havoc with professional golfers with golfers in general but especially for professionals because they're expecting one thing and something completely different happens because of that I will take the earliest of the early tee times on Thursday morning and not afraid to use the Friday PM because their gusts are not nearly as drastic as they are in the morning. Having said all this, I'm definitely not going to be using players that are bad in the wind. It looks like wind will definitely be a factor for all of Friday, most of Saturday, even a little bit of Thursday as well. Now Sunday looks great and we'll get to that in a second. But that is the explanation as to why I am actually going to give a decent favor to the Thursday a.m., Friday p.m., half of the draw because of the extreme difference in the projected sustained winds versus the wind gusts. And if we zoom out, we take a look at the weekend looks like a lot of the same saturday a lot of wind maybe not necessarily as much in sustained winds but wind gusts up into the 30s and then sunday is very very calm looks like a great day for a championship round of golf in san antonio on sunday so uh, the wind is going to be a decent factor i think maybe a little bit tomorrow but maybe not much but definitely friday and saturday and then tapers off Sunday. So again, one last time, I'll bring you into the zoomed in of the super forecast. There's your Thursday forecast and then your Friday. So with that, I've got a few of the, or I've got the tee times up over here off to the side. Uh, so if there are any questions on what half of the draw a player is, um, make uh, we can make note of that. But with that, we're going to move to Fantasy National, and because of the wind that is in the forecast, you will notice I have, or I was going to, have the moderate and windy conditions filter selected. In the past two years, 
These are your top players in moderate and windy conditions. Rory, Jordan Spieth, Corey Connors, Denny McCarthy, Matt Fitzpatrick, Max Homa, Adam Scott, Ricky Fowler, Harry Hall, and Patrick Rogers are your top 10 in terms of total performance in moderate and windy conditions. Scrolling on down a little bit, uh, Ben On, Colin Morikawa, Carson Young, Andrew Novak, Adam Shank, Brendan Todd, Eric Cole, Brian Harmon, Mark, Harber, Mark Hubbard, Akshay Batia. There's your top 20. And you can see it uh, bound down to about the top 30 or so. These are your top players in the wind the past couple of years. So definitely give these con these guys a consideration, a boost in your considerations um, if you have not finalized your lineups already as they have generally played the best in the wind. The other end of the spectrum, players who have not played well in the wind the past couple of years. Kevin Kisner, uh, Carl Yuan, Ryan Brim, Andrew Landry, Eric Van Royen, although I always have an issue with this one because you can see in the windiest of windy conditions, he's pretty good. He's getting hurt in this moderate category here. So that one I take a little bit with a grain of salt. Maddie Schmid, Stuart Sink, Justin Lauer, Camille Vajegas, Davis Riley, on down. Tom Kim has not played well in the wind either. So uh, make sure you give these guys a little bit of a downgrade. And again, it looks like Tom Kim is a little bit uh, different um, case like Eric Van Royen. He's played very well in the wind and he's not in moderate. He's lost half a stroke in moderate winds. So that's why I always check the moderate and windy conditions. So make sure you give these players a little bit of a downgrade considering the wind is supposed to be really pick up this week at San Antonio at least, especially Friday and Saturday. And overall, these players have not played terribly well in the wind. Uh, but one thing we absolutely know about the Oaks course, it is a very long course. Yes, it is a par 72, but it still measures well over 7,400 yards. So your top performers on long courses the past couple of years. Sam Stevens, Akshay Batia, Max Homa, Matt Kuchar, Nico Echevarria, Nikolai Hoygaard, Michael Kim, Jimmy Walker, Corey Connors, Kevin Chappell, there's your top 10. Scrolling on down a little bit further, Colin Morikawa, Hayden Springer, much less in terms of number of rounds. Nate Lashley, Eric Barnes, Jordan Spieth, Rory, Fitzpatrick, Harry Hall, Victor Perry, Brendan Todd. There's a look at your top players on long courses. So anybody who is at the top of this list uh, in the wind and on long courses, players like uh, Corey Connors was up there. Um, let's see. I believe Rory was, Rory was number one in terms of wind, so definitely somebody to, to uh, put an asterisk on considering his total performance in both long and windy. Uh, don't, no one else really jumps up to, uh, jumps into mind immediately. But there's a look at your top performers on long courses and the players who have not played long courses well. Chandler Phillips, Andrew Landry, Stuart Sink, Kevin Kisner, Adam Svensson, Ryan Bram, Chad Ramey, Garrick Higo has not played long course as well the past couple of years. Charlie Hoffman, uh, Zach Blair, Adam Long, Taylor Pendrith, Billy Horschel, Justin Lauer, Alexander, Joel Damon, etc., etc. So with that, um, that's enough of a review, I think. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into the mixed condition model that I've made for this week um, for the Oaks course and the Valero Texas Open. It'll give you an idea on the players who I am focused on this week in uh, DFS. We begin the, the mixed condition model with 20% in strokes gain approach. This is just a ball striking course, especially as you climb the leaderboard. Think about your winners, your Corey Connors. Um, JJ Spawn was a, was a ball striker, especially leading into that week. Uh, Jordan Spieth, which explains a lot of this, but his irons were quite dialed. Uh, when he won back in 2021. So this course rewards fantastic iron play. And I wanted to highlight that in the mixed condition model. So 20% in strokes gain approach. Again, I've mentioned it all week. Um, I was a little surprised to see it Sunday, 
but really backed it up in the data on Monday. Around the green is going to be a pretty big deal. I might have this weighted a little bit too much. This might be over weighting the around the green, but with that wind, I think greens are going to get hit, uh, going to get missed more often than you think. And these greens aren't easy to hit in general anyway. So 15% in strokes gained around the green this week. 10% in putting. This is just poetry vialis, what we've been on the past month. All of those courses that we've talked about for the past month that make up that sample size. So 10% in the past couple of years on poetry vialis. 5% in greens on long courses. I wanted to put more in here, but as I looked through the data, um, I felt more and more comfortable, you know, factoring in a little bit more around the green, uh, factoring in quite a bit of par fives, which we'll talk about uh, lower on in the mixed condition model. So if anything, this might be a little bit light. You could argue to put 10% around the green and 10% in greens gained. But this is where I'm at. Uh, using the long course filter, 5% greens gained. Uh, players who are going to gain in greens are going to gain quite a bit on the other players. 5% in sand saves. And I know I didn't talk about this at all, all week. This is, again, thanks to Gabe and then really, really digging into the data. The Oaks course is the highest in terms of sand saves strokes gained um, on the PGA Tour. Uh, no other course contributes more strokes gained for sand saves on the PGA Tour. Um, it's just going to be a big thing. This is another part of the around the green, absolutely. But you see, I'm, I'm kind of focused on two aspects of a player's game. Irons, players like Corey Connors who won't have to rely on their around the green, or for the majority of players, players who are uh, decent but probably going to miss their fair share of greens, I want to see how good they are around the green, and sand saves comes into that a little bit, especially here at the Oaks course. So 5% in sand saves, 5% in opportunities on long courses. Uh, this is kind of taking the spot of total procs. Kind of went back and forth with myself whether I wanted to include total procs or opportunities gained. I uh, ended up going with opportunities, considering the players who are actually going to hit these greens. Um, these greens aren't overly large, and with the contours, uh, the slopes and whatnot, if a player is keeping their ball on the green, it's probably going to end up being an opportunity. Uh, opportunity gained by Fantasy Nationals definition is a an approach shot that is within 15 feet of the hole. Um, uh, I believe still hitting the green or fringe in regulation. So um, I, I felt a little bit more confident with this over prox total proximity. 10% in birdies gained. I did not end up factoring in birdies or better. Uh, I just think, I don't think there are enough birdies, or excuse me, there are enough eagles around the Oaks course to justify looking at birdies or better. So I'm just looking at birdies gained, but that could be one area that I might be possibly weak to if uh, some eagles start dropping. They just haven't in the past you know, three or four years or so. But 10% in birdies gained, again, on long courses. We round out the mixed condition model 5% on this specific length of par threes. Only 5%. We saw all week that the par threes really didn't contribute a whole lot. And then I can hear you already asking, or mentioning to yourself, you know, why focus on the 175 to 200 when there is a par three in each of these ranges? Well, except for the 225 plus, which will never come into the 175 to 200 bucket. Look at these ranges and look at these yardages. 171 easily could play into that 175 to 200. 187, or excuse me, 183, pretty well, pretty well smack dab in the middle there of that range. And then the 200 to 225 is at 207, so you could absolutely see that falling into the 175 to 200. And if you wanted the data to back that up, we showed it uh, Monday night that 
the 175 to 200 contributes about 60 to 65 percent of the strokes gained in par threes. So I just felt comfortable looking at this range. Again, maybe we need to look at just total par threes, and that could be a weakness. But I didn't think it was significant enough um, to look at you know all par threes and the 175 to 200 because they generally don't contribute much here. I mean, the last two winners, Corey Connors and J.J. Spawn, were negative in par three performance when they won. Um, so they just don't contribute a whole lot. But uh, this is a, a pure data selection or pure data point about the Oaks course that the 175 to 200 par threes or the most important range of par threes here. We round out the mixed condition model, 10% in par fours, 15% in par fives. You gotta take advantage of these par fives down uh, here at the Oaks course. Um, they're your best scoring opportunities as most par fives are on PGA Tour courses, but especially here at the Oaks course. And we saw that par fours contributed a whole lot for at least Corey Connors. JJ Spawn played them well, but Corey Connors was on a whole different level when he won. Um, last year on the par fours. So there's a look at the mixed condition model. Hopefully I've explained the thought process behind it. Perhaps some areas where I could be weak. Again, you know, maybe I'm a little bit too heavy in the around the green with 15% here and the 5% in sand saves. Maybe I'm too light here. That would be my guess before the tournament starts. You don't, you see, I don't have any off the tee. There's been a year or two where off the tee contributed a little bit more than the others, but uh, most often it is kind of lagged behind in terms of importance, especially since uh, the rough isn't uh, penalizing here. Um, it's it's not an, a difficult driving course, so I don't foresee off the tee playing a big deal. Uh, you know, if Eagles uh, happen more often this year, I'll be weak to that considering I'm just looking at birdies gained. Um if it's the other ranges of par threes or if there's a specific range of par four, par five. But that's the mixed condition model that I have for the Oaks course in the Valero Texas Open this week. With that, we're going to move to Microsoft Excel, the reveal of my rankings, and a reminder that my rankings are based on three criteria. The FNGC rank, Fantasy National rank, uh, spits out a... a numerical ranking based on the mixed condition model we just talked about course value this is um, an attempt at giving a player a value at how well they have played that course the past five years of course so now we're, this week we're talking about the oaks course the, the lower the number the smaller the number the better and then we are playing dfs so uh, we are trying to factor in project uh, projected ownerships uh, we're trying to find unique plays, so unique ownership or ownership is a part of my rankings as well. My rankings for this week's Valero Texas Open: Corey Connors, probably no surprise. Not really a uh, a bold uh, going out on a limb there, not necessarily. But Corey Connors is my number one player this week. Number two is Hideki, Lucas Glover third, Alex Noren, Keith Mitchell round out my top five. Jordan Spieth, Bo Hostler. Max Homa, Matt McNeely, and 6500 priced Andrew Novak round out my top 10. So you'll notice I don't take into consideration uh, wind. That's why I, I go through Wind Finder at the beginning of the show and tell you what I'm going to do with my lineups. That way you can uh, adjust this however you see fit. Maybe you disagree with my uh, perspective on uh, the wind and, and what half of the draw uh, is favored. So... That's why I give you the power to uh, to make the decisions on your own, and I don't factor in the wind or the uh, wind or tea times. I do that on my own when I make lineups, um, you know, off stream. But there's a look at my top ten. Uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise to see Andrew Novak up here, but look, he's been playing extremely well lately. Top ten in this field with irons. Uh, top 15 and around the green, the two most important aspects we have of our mixed condition model. He's been top 15 in both. He's been very good at the par fives as well. Great putting on this surface. So once you really dig into it, I mean, he was sixth per uh, Fantasy Nationals raw numbers. So really like what I saw with Andrew Novak. He's just not 
uh, as unique as you might think he will be. Um, otherwise, not really a whole lot of surprise. When you're focused on irons, Lucas Glover is going to pop a little bit. Uh, and he's been very good around the green this 2024 season. Uh, Keith Mitchell, for as much as he's uh, crushed my soul on some of these outright wagers I've had on him, uh, he still has played well. He has collapsed in you know the final rounds or whatnot, but he's played well. Third in irons, par fives, he generally obliterates. Uh, so not a whole lot of surprise there seeing him rise either. Ball Hostler mainly getting helped by the fact that he's so unique. But you see, I mean, he was top 25 purely by the numbers in Fantasy National. Outside the top 100 in approach, that does kind of scare you, but he demolishes par fives. He's played very, very well here at the Oaks course. Nothing really except for this for his irons have been bad. Everything else is generally in this um, solid green to even elite in the par five. The one name you see that's not up here, and we'll get into that when we go through the price board, is Rory. Rory rated out horrendously for me. And a lot of that is to do with his subpar performance so far in 2024. Uh, Ricky did not rate out well for me either. There's Rory all the way down here outside my top 100. Almost outside the top 100 in irons. Does not been very good in terms of around the green. For as much firepower as Rory has, he's actually been kind of middling at these par fives, and he's never been good on Poa Trivialis. Now, the birdies gain on long courses is very, very solid. Uh, he's been very good at this range of par threes, but when you are... Red statistically in three of the four most heavily weighted um, metrics in a mixed condition model, you're going to fall. So there's Rory outside my top 100 in my rankings. Now, do I really think he's, you know, 102nd in this field and uh, more likely to make the cut or miss the cut than make the cut? No, not really. But at his price and his projected ownership, which I also have Gabe's. Um, projected ownerships off to the side here too. It's going to be a pretty easy fade for me. But anyway, I just wanted to, to look at that. We'll expand on that here momentarily. Let's go ahead and sort on the price board. Take a look at where a lot of our fellow contestants seem to be gravitating on the leaderboard, where they are going in these various price ranges to players, and how we can maneuver around the chalk. So let me bring up, again, as I mentioned, I have Gabe's source. He is kind enough to share that with me. So I've got that here off to the side. In the five digits, in the 10Ks, we have four players this week. We have Rory at 12-3, Hideki at 10-6, Ludwig Ober at 10-5, and Colin Morikawa at 10-1. You see, really, only Hideki rated out extremely well for me. A lot of that has to do with this course value. Uh, the Oaks course has been traditionally one of the more predictive year-over-year -year courses on the PGA Tour in terms of success. If you've played it well before, you're generally going to play it well again. Also, in, the, um, in terms of the ownerships, in terms of the 5Ks, Morikawa is indeed your most unique play, uh, Members of Fantasy National don't seem to be gravitating towards him really at all sub 10 percent sub nine percent now per game source we see that it's about uh, 14 and a half percent so a little bit higher but clearly the most unique option in the 10ks i kind of like colin morikawa this week this number is a little bit uh, high arbitrarily because he hasn't played the oaks course in the past five years i think he'll probably like the Oaks course, uh, considering it, it is, uh, it rewards iron play, and that is what Morikawa was known for. Now, having said that, he has not been as great with the irons as he generally has been or is thought to be. He's been more good than great or elite with his irons in 2024, but I still think this is a decent fit for Morikawa. 
Uh, he, he's on the, what I think is on the better half of the draw. He tees it up early tomorrow and then late on Friday. He's good in the wind. Yes, the putter is uh, just just awful. There's no other way around it. It's just awful, especially on this on this surface. But I do like Morikawa, especially with the uh, lack of ownership. The most projected on player in this range looks to be Ludwig Ober at anywhere between 20 to 30%. My guess is he's probably going to be a little bit lower, probably in the 22 to 24% would be my guess. He's only played this event one time, so I would not get too carried away with this course value, but he did not play it well his first time. The irons are better. The par fives, we all know it. he's very, very uh, elite in ball striking. But he does struggle with greens, and he has struggled a little bit on long courses. So it is, um, it's enough to make you cautious, especially if his ownership does creep into the 20 to 25% range, which is expected to do. I'm not going to call it a full fade, especially since he is on the good half of the draw, at least in, in, in my mind, being or teeing up early tomorrow and then late on Friday. I can't call it a full fade, but it's, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have 20% Ludwig Obert, I'll tell you that much. Now, Hideki, the one that is rated the best of these four, is the only one of these four that tees it up late tomorrow and then early on Friday. Um, again, I can't call it a full fade, but you know he's hovering right at 20% at both places. Number one around the green, top 20 in approach. He's When he is not withdrawn from this event, he's played it extremely well. I don't like the tee time. I don't like the ownership, but I'm sure I'll have Hideki a little bit. I'm going to try not to have him 20%. Probably won't have him 20%, but I still think it's a fine play. He's just very, very popular. I'm full fading Rory. I'm just I'm willing to lose to Rory this week. All of the all of the numbers have not been good for 2024. Um, all the pressure he has leading into trying to complete the slam next week. I just, I don't want any part of Rory. He's played the Oaks course once. It was not good at all. I'm out on Rory. If I lose to Rory, I accept that because I'm willing to, to play other players um, that are comparable to him, I think, especially in terms of, of performance lately, like Max Homa, like Morikawa, Speed Connors. I'm willing to play players that are comparable to him at much less ownership and a lot cheaper and who are in better form. So I'm just out on Rory. Um, and Rory, per Gabe source, is sitting at 22% ownership. Fantasy National seems to be more in line with me looking at the, at the raw numbers, the data behind it, and a, and a full fade. So in the 10Ks, I will make Colin Morikawa my number one player. The combination of being on the right half of the draw in my mind, um, the most unique option in the 10Ks. I'm not terribly worried about the putter uh, on this surface. I think I'm I'm more confident in Morikawa's iron play than I am worried about his putter. Although it is, you know, to be fair, it is a worry. That's why I'm not overly excited on on Morikawa, but I will make him the number one player. In the 10Ks, I'll make Hideki second. Um, everything lines up very well for him. He's played very well here. You see, by Fantasy National, he was the number one player just purely based on the metrics and the numbers. Um, so I, I like Hideki. He's just not not unique. <laughs> and he doesn't have the best half of the draw. I'll make Obert third and Rory fourth. I'm going to try to limit my use of Ludwig Obert. Um just because I think he's going to be very, very darn popular, perhaps, perhaps, except for maybe Corey Connors, perhaps the most owned player in the on the DFS slate this week. So that's a look at the 10Ks. Moving into the 9s, this is where I've been living, starting my lineups. Love Max Homa this week. Sub 10% on a player that is doesn't have a red statistic across here. Not a single one. 87th here on the par fours is his worst. Everything else is, you know, great 
to even elite opportunities, sand saves, birdies on long courses. The irons in the around the green have been good, not necessarily great to elite, but I, I love everything about Max Homie. He's got the right half of the draw, teeing up early tomorrow. Takes advantage of these par fives. Love everything about Max Homa. Uh, he is more popular than what Fantasy National is projecting. I would think I'll be ecstatic if he's truly 8.5%. But I, I truly think uh, Gabe's source is more in line, sitting at you know around 13 to 14%. But even so, to get a player of Max Homa's quality in this field at 13 to 14%, I, I'd jump all over that. Uh, if Max Homa does not play well, I will lose. I am going to be extremely overweight on Max Homa. Uh, Fitzpatrick, I don't know. Um, obviously very good with par fives and very good putting. But I usually try to target Matt Fitzpatrick when it's very difficult. And the Oaks course isn't overly difficult. It's just kind of average in terms of difficulty. I think of Fitzpatrick, I think of places like the Arnold Palmer where he blew up in my face. But Arnold Palmer, the Masters, the U.S. Open, the PGA, places that pars are extremely good scorers is when I generally look at Matt Fitzpatrick. So I'm not, I'm not excited about Fitzpatrick this week. Having said that, he does have the good half of the draw, I think. Yeah, he's on the good half of the draw, so you can think about it. He's just never played here, so I, I don't know. Spieth, going to be pretty darn popular. Uh, this is one player that Fantasy National and Gabe Source are wildly different. This is about the biggest difference I have ever seen in terms of the two sources and ownerships. Fantasy National's at you know slightly less than ten percent, whereas Gabe Source has Spieth at twenty three percent. And I'm much more inclined to believe Gabe Source on this one, considering the popularity of the player. The Texas narrative, his irons haven't been good, but a lot of other, a lot of other things have been. Around the green, par fives, good you know, good putter. He's number one, number one birdies gained on long courses. Former champion here at the Oaks Course, so really I really like Spieth, but do not be uh, fooled by the projected ownerships here at Fantasy National. He's going to be much, much more popular than what this is showing. Connors is probably going to be the most popular player on the slate this week for good reason. Number one in irons. Yes, his around the green is not very good, but that hasn't stopped him from, from playing this course extremely well. Par fives is good. As much as his putter can be bulky, it's actually decent or middling on Poetry Vialis. He gains a bunch of birdies on long courses. Gains a bunch of greens on long courses. Like um, I, everything about Corey Connors seems to be good. I'm going to use Corey Connors as chalk. I'll eat. Um, he's sitting at you know roughly 20 to 22 percent on on both sources, but that's chalk. I'll eat. Number one player in my ranking. Not going to use Tommy Fleetwood either. He has not played this course. His irons have been disastrous to be honest with you on the PGA Tour this 2024 season and he's not taking advantage of par fives at all he's just not in very good form I, I I'm gonna I'll lose Tommy but at least data wise everything looks like uh, Tommy's just kind of struggling right now so I don't want any part of Tommy hey good evening P thanks for jumping in chat uh, much appreciated hope you're hopefully you're ready for the Valero Texas Open we'll get off this uh, at least for, for yours truly, this, this losing streak that I've been on has seemingly not getting a lot right lately. Hopefully we're going to turn it around the week before the Masters. Um, been on, rated out well at the very bottom of the 9Ks. Okay, he's just a popular player. Um, 14% at both places. Um, long courses he generally plays very, very well. 4th and 31st on the two metrics that we have um, that we that we use the long course filter. It's okay. He's just always pretty popular. He's been okay at this course as well. So in the 9Ks, look, I love Max Homa. He, 
I have to make Corey Connors my number one player. I mean, he is number one in my rankings. He's the defending champion. I I, I don't see Corey Connors missing the cut. Famous last words. Throw it in my face when he does next week. But I just don't see him struggling here. He, he is, He's never struggled here. So I'll make Connors number one in the nine case. But I love everything about Max Homa this week. The tee time. Um... The irons, the around the green is good enough. Of course, he's good, great on the surface putting. I, just, I like everything about Max Homa. I'm sure I'll use a little bit of Ben on, but not a whole lot. I am completely off of Tommy Fleetwood. Uh, knowing that Jordan Spieth's going to be more than 20% owned makes me very gun-shy about Jordan Spieth, but look, everything rates out well for him. I can't say it's a bad play. Just understand that he's going to be much higher than this 10% that Fantasy National projects. Moving into the eights. I'm not going to go through all these. Look, Alex Norn play, or, um, rated out very well for me. Probably for good reason. He's in he's in pretty good form as well. One of the better putters on this surface for sure. I was surprised to see that he's actually 10th in par 5 performance so far in 2024. At least 10th in this field. Um, but he does struggle with some long courses. He does struggle. Not the best with greens, not the best in opportunities. So he'll be he'll be scrambling quite a bit this week, I think. Um, I don't hate it, but again, another one of these very, very popular plays this week. Anywhere between 16 to 20 percent would be my guess on Alex Norn, and that's a that's a lot for a player that, I just don't see him on the level of a Max Homa, a Colin Morikawa, a Corey Connors. I think he's a step below that. So for me, I just I can't stomach that amount of ownership. I can't call it a full fade. I'm sure I'll have him because I play you know I play multiple lineups, but it's it's I'm trying to limit my use of him. Elsewhere in the AKs, you see where these rankings are. I, I'm just not anywhere around here. I'm just not. Um, Tom Kim, Ricky Fowler. I was even surprised Russell Henley was rated as low as he is, but look at his irons. His irons have not been good in 2024 at all. The around the green's been good, but the irons have really struggled. So if you want to, Russell Henley might be a decent speculation, to be honest with you. Russell Henley sitting at 15% per gauge source, so a lot of the more general public might be on Russell Henley than Fantasy National. But we know what kind of iron player he is. He's just struggled lately. But if you look back at his career, like his career baseline, might be an interesting look for Russell Henley. But otherwise, like, it's... I might use a little bit of Norin, but I'm nowhere in the 8Ks. Like, this this whole range feels like a full fade to me. It really does. I'm just nowhere in the 8Ks, and that tells you the kind of lineups I'm building this week. Moving into the upper 7s, Cebez, Aaron Rye, Batia, Mitchell, all these guys, very popular. As you can see, Fantasy National, all of them have... You know, in anywhere between 15 and 16 percent. Let's see, per game source, you've got Bazay Newt at 16, uh, Aaron Rise at 11, Batia's at 13, Mitchell's at 10. So all these guys are getting um, getting some attention. I think Batia could be interesting, although the putter is pretty bad, but he's been great, good with the irons. I do like Batia. And of these four, no, oh, excuse me, so it's Aaron Reich, so, so apologies. So I was going to say Batia had the good half of the draw. That that was a lie. Aaron Rye, of these four, has the good half of the draw. Sebez, Batia, and Mitchell all tee off in the afternoon tomorrow, meaning they have the very gusty Friday morning. It's Aaron Rye who has the good half of the draw. I still like Batia. He's been good in the wind lately. Um, his par fives are good, and he's he's really played long course as well. But he did not play the Oaks course well. Aaron Rye has played very well here. 
which makes a lot of sense. He's an iron-based player, and this course is rewarded irons. So just understand that none of these four are particularly unique. The most unique in here looks to be Mitchell and or Rye. So if that's the case, I like Rye. I do like all four of these players, but I'll probably gravitating more towards Rye because of the perceived good half of the draw. I do like Cbez a decent amount here as well, despite the fact that you've got you know a poor around the green, poor par fives. He's number one in par fours. I, I like Cbez a decent amount. He's just getting hurt by the fact that he's fairly popular. But, you know, we moved down into the mid-sevens. Like, I, I really like Bo Hossler this week, and that's scary for me to say that. But this is the second player that if he does not play well, I will lose behind Max Homa. If Bo Hossler does not play well, I will lose. But I'm going to have an extreme amount of Bo Hossler. Now, Bo Hostler is at 12% per Gabe source. So, you know, if you think his ownership is going to creep up into the double digits, you might not necessarily be as high on him. But, you know, third in par fives, the putter on this surface is good. He's been great at the Oaks course in the past. So I like Bo Hostler a lot this week. Mav McNeely is somebody that um, has been talked about a little bit on the show in, in recent weeks, and he's he's finally rating out well. Despite the very poor irons in 2024, he's still rating out well. The around the green, par fives, the putter, opportunities on long courses, excellent. You know, great at par fours as well. So Matt McNeely is somebody to think about as well. He's sitting right at that 10% number at both sources. So perhaps give a look to McNeely. Um, and he's on the good half of the draw as well. Uh, starting to move into the lower sevens, Lucas Glover, anytime you're going to focus on irons, he's going to rate out well. Um, he's been very good at both irons and around the green. He's going to be very popular, though, is the issue. I think he's going to be pretty darn popular, and a chalky Lucas Glover is always scary. He's been... Great in his three trips here to the Oaks course. Everything lines up for it. Just understand, like Aaron Rye and Bazadenhut, Batia, Mitchell, you know, Spieth above. He's just not going to be very unique. I don't think it's a bad play by any means, but he's not going to be unique. Um, Hoygaard, I don't mind. I don't mind Hoygaard at all. I think the irons are better than this. Of course, he's going to have to be better with the putter. But he's going to take advantage, more advantage of par fives than I would think. And you see, he actually top 30 the Oaks the one time he's played it. I kind of like Hoygaard. I do. I kind of like Hoygaard this week. Brendan Todd is somebody else that rated out very well for me. Middling ownership, you know, right at this 8%. Now, 8% per game source, 5% per Fantasy National, so or 4 to 5%. I'm always a little bit wary of Brendan Todd because it's all about the putter. So if his irons just aren't there in a week, it's going to be really bad for him, but you can take a look at it. If you're really in the bottom half of the sevens, you know, other than Hoygaard, maybe a little bit of Lucas Glover, I like Sam Ryder as well. Look at the irons. Talk about putting. He's the number one putter on this surface the past two years. Um, par fours have been good. So I like Sam Ryder. He's been okay at this course. He hasn't been great, but he's been okay. So Sam Ryder is who I've been gravitating a lot in the uh, bottom half of the sevens to kind of round out the lots of nines that I've been playing. Um I do have a few plays in the sixes and in the fives that I would like to share with you all. So in the six Ks, um, look, Doug Gim's been in good form lately. He isn't necessarily the best there, has not played this course the best, but you know, you can always take a look at it. He's just gonna be more popular than than what you than what you, than what you want. Nine percent fantasy national, eight percent per game source. 
you know, the irons are good. Number one on par fives. So he's just a little bit more popular than, than what you want him to be, but it's probably an okay play. Um, everything in terms of recent form is bad for Matt Kuchar. I mean, the irons are one of the worst in this field. Par fives he's not taking advantage of. I'm going to highlight Matt Kuchar for one simple thing. He is four for four with an average finish of sixth in the past five years here at the Oaks course. It's something about this place he just really, really likes. And probably a lot of it has to do with the putter. He's also the number one in birdies gained. I think it was with Rory. Somebody else was number one up here. Or at least, yeah, number one, Spieth. So with Spieth, he's the number one birdies gained player on long courses. I'm not in love with it, but if you're a big believer in course history, especially at the Oaks course, take a look at Matt Kuchar. But recent form is is horrendous. Elsewhere in the 6Ks, I want to, you know, other than the top 10 Andrew Novak uh, play, or ten, you know, top ten, tenth in my rankings. Um, he's not getting a lot of love per fan, uh, per game source, but fantasy national members are gravitating towards him a lot. So I would, I would probably think he's more in the maybe seven to eight percent range. Uh, but everything lines up for him pretty well in terms of recent form. You know, irons have been great around the green's been great. Putting's been good to great. To be fair to him. Uh, Novak is on the good half of the draw as well, so nothing, nothing to um, to shy you away from Andrew Novak except for maybe this. Uh, moving into the lower sixes, Lashley rated out well. I'm I'm tired of seeing Nate Lashley. You know, I backed him for two or three weeks, didn't play well, and then he he top fives or top tens uh, the tournament that I'm off of him. So I don't I don't know with Nate Lashley. But in the, in the bottom half of the Sixers, in the bottom part of the Sixers, I really want to highlight Johnny Vegas. He's played pretty darn well here at the Oaks course. He's at 4% per both sources, uh, less than that at Gabe's source. I really like Johnny Vegas. His irons have been good. He's never been a short game player. This is all about the ball striking. It's all about the ball striking. To, irons have been good. Par fives he take, takes advantage of. Hits plenty of greens when it's uh, or on long courses. Um, this is all about the ball striking. And I, 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 if you're really going to get greedy, I do like me some Johnny Vegas this week. Moving into the fives, I will mention a couple of names here for you all. First off is Sam Stevens, the number one player on long courses the past two years. Yes, the current form isn't great. I'll give you that. But he plays long courses so, so very well. Top 10 in birdies gained on long courses. Top 15 in greens on long courses. And opportunities, he's been good as well. You see, he was also the solo runner-up last year. So take a look at Sam Stevens. I'm not saying to, to use it or, or you know, uh, base your lineups off of it by any means. But if you're really, really wanting to get super, super greedy, I don't hate using Sam Stevens a time or two. Dylan Wu, somebody else that I want to highlight for you all. Uh, the irons are good right now. Putter on this surface has been pretty good. He just did, has not played well here, and he's, he's played it a couple of times. So that's the concern with Dylan Wu, is that in two tries, not just one, but two tries, he hasn't been very good here. And then lastly... In terms of 5Ks, you know what? I'll throw him a bone. Why not? I'll give a little little bit of a nod to Uncle Luke. He hasn't been terrible here. The irons are better than what has shown in 2024. He's generally a good iron player. The around the green's been solid so far in 2024. Decent putter on this surface. If you're dumpster diving, to use your term, P., you can take a small look at, at Luke Donald, but I I much, much, much prefer Dylan Wu, Johnny Vegas. I mean, even Nico Echevarria, you could take a small look at. I'm not a believer in Chez Revy. He rated out in the top 20 for me. 
You see, purely by the numbers, he was quite middling. He's catapulting in my rankings based on his one performance at the Oaks course, which was very, very good, and his unique amount of ownership. Now, his irons and his around the green have been very, very good in 2024, but that's about it that's going well for him. See the par fives are quite middling. Putting on this surface is quite middling. On long courses, Ches Reeves generally been pretty bad. Generally been pretty bad. Those two and opportunities haven't been good on long courses, so I'm not a believer in him being 18th in my rankings. So in the 5Ks, I'd, I'd much prefer going to players like Dylan Wu and um, at 58. I probably said Johnny Vegas. He's at 62. At 58 uh, or 59. Where, where did he go? Sam Stevens, 58. So there's a look at the price board and where the chalk seems to be. And how I uh, envision uh, the ownerships falling and, and some potential pivots off of the chalk. Let's start making some lineups. We'll start with tiers contests for those who play tiers. And then we'll move into these big GPPs and make some classic lineups. Free projections are loving Lindheim for value. Who the vook is that guy? <laughs> um, so Lindheim somebody that I've used uh, before. Um, generally it's been on these alternate field events, but you know, uh, hadn't been great in 2024 clearly, but he is somebody that has been on the radar for me. Absolutely. I'll bring you over to Lindheim just very, very quickly. Uh, I want sort of on price 52 Bjork and Ben Coles. Uh, I'll just do, I'll, I'll just look at um, Lindheim uh, because of time. Bjork, I don't know enough about cause since he's coming over from the DP World Tour. Just, just being honest, I just don't have enough info on him. Uh, just whatever he's done in 2024. Coles. Mm. Now, Nicholas Lindheim, first thing that jumps off the page, you look at his performance in the wind. Um... So Lauer wasn't all that great, but Toasty clearly was a great play. And I vaguely remember me saying that I was all I would I didn't mind Lauer. I wanted no part of Toasty. So A plus from uh, from me last week for you, P. Clearly, <laughs> uh, but you see Lindheim, Windy has been great. Has been <laughs> just super fantastic in the wind. He actually plays average difficulty for whatever importance you want to put into this. He has played average difficult courses pretty well. Uh, again, he's been in awful form in 2024. He's missed every single cut he's played. No doubt about it. But you look at his fall, like top 30 a couple times. The Wyndham was okay. He's been he he's been okay at points. So, eh. I'm not, I'm not in love with it this week, but only because you, you happen to mention him. I mean, it is somebody that has been on the radar before. So I at least know who the fuck that guy is. The other two, eh. Uh, ben Coles and Toasty. Or no, Ben Coles and Bjork. I don't even know where those two are in the price. So, oh, there's Ben Coles. <laughs> well, he's got the Alejandro Toasty from last week, so apparently Ben Coles is going to run her up. <laughs> and then Bjork. I have no idea where. I think he's probably a little bit more. Yeah. So he also did not rate out well at all. So to be fair, none of the three did. All right, let's move to making some lineups here. Uh, as we've already gone to the hour mark and. Still got to make some lineups. Uncle Luke, that's right. Hey, Tony, good evening. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for jumping in chat. Hopefully you are ready for the Valero Texas Open. How was Memorial Park? Uh, meant to catch up with you on that earlier this week and forgot. So 
Uh, hopefully you remember to complete your homework and, gay, and, and to give the community your, uh, your thoughts on Memorial Park. Hopefully you had a good time and that you preferred, uh, performed much better than I did with DFS. All right. For those who play tiers contests, we have Rory, Hideki, and Ludwig Obert in Tier 1. I'm actually going to take Hideki. Uh, again, I just want no part of Rory this week. Obert is going to be extremely popular. Just give me Hideki in Tier 1. I think it's the safer play. Um, tier 2, Morikawa, Homa, Fitzpatrick, Spieth, and Connors. As much as I am loathe to not use the number one player in my rankings. It's going to be very hard for me not to use Corey Connors. I'm actually going to go to Max Homa in a tiers contest. This is where I'm gaining my uniqueness in a tiers contest. Everything about Corey Connors you should like, and especially in a tiers contest. So it's very hard. I mean, this is a this is a 1A and a and a 1A A A A A A. <laughs> But only because I think he's going to be unique enough off of Corey Connors, I'm going to go to Max Homa. And if if I if I played multiple tiers contests, one would be Homa and one would be Connors. But I'll take Homa in the singleton tiers contest or tiers lineup that we make. Tier three: Tommy, Ben on, Billy Horschel, Alex Norman, and Brian Harmon. Ugh. I don't like any of this. Can I just take Connors and like skip tier three? God, I guess give me Alex Norin. Just I mean he's so far and away. I don't know. Ben on rates out very well too, but yeah, give me Alex Norin. I'm not in love with it. I just don't like a whole lot in this tier as is. So I guess just give me Norin. I'm not. I, I'm not crazy about it. Tier four: Adam Scott, English, Henley, Tom Kim, Fowler, Seabaz, and Aaron Rye. For me, it's pretty clearly between these two. Uh, you might casually take a look at Russell Henley, but I'm going to go with Aaron Rye over Seabez because of the perceived better half of the draw. If you go Seabez, I don't blame you one bit, but give me Aaron Rye. Tier 5, Batia, Mitchell, Cole, Hostler, McCarthy, McNeely, EVR. McNeely is interesting, but I'll take Bell Hostler. Uh, him and Homa are my two kind of, you know, out there plays this week or unique plays that I think are going to be uh, pretty good, especially off the chalk of Batia and Mitchell and probably Eric Cole. So give me Bell Hostler in Tier 5. Lastly, Tier 6, we have Spawn, yeah, J.J. Spawn, Matty Schmidz, Vincent, Toasty, Lashley, Johnny Vegas, Ryan Fox. Johnny Vegas, pretty clear in a way. No we have sands or butts about it. So quick recap, this tiers contest or this tiers construction goes Hideki, Max Homa by the slightest of slightest margins over Connors, but I will take Homa. Tier three goes Norin. Tier four goes Aaron Rye. Tier five goes Bo Hustler. And then tier six goes Johnny Vegas. All right, <laughs> let's make some classic lineups. Build some chalky lineups that it looks like our fellow contestants are making and then how we can maneuver around that. So in or to try to build these very chalky lineups, and I'll bring up Gabe's ownership as well. Um, in the 10Ks, like everyone seems to be going to Ludwig Ober over Rory. So we'll go Ober. Corey Connors is absolutely in this. Um, at the bottom end here, like McNeely at 11% per Gabe source. Um, you got Eckroat, Victor Peri. Like McNeely's a 10 here. Whoopsie. Glover, 14%. I'm more inclined to believe that a lot of a lot of people will go to Lucas Glover. So let's try let's try bodying them out at Lucas Glover. I don't know how much wiggle room they're gonna have because nobody really nobody really in the six Ks on down is getting a whole lot uh, at both places. You see Ryan Moore, thirteen percent, Novak at twelve and a half, but they're nowhere close to this per game source. So I'm a little bit hesitant to believe 
that. Um, we have Glover at 73. We go, yeah, probably McNeely at 74. Yeah, and then you can go something like Batia and Mitchell, who are gaining quite a bit of, of ownership here. Hostler also, according to Gabe Source. Gabe's Source. This is looking like perhaps um, the chalky shell of a lineup. Uh, McNeely, a little bit more popular per Gabe Source. But 16% here due to these two who are going to be overwhelmingly, seemingly, the, no, the first and second uh, highest owned players. And, you know, I love Corey Connors this week, so I'll be using him. But you're not going to be able to combine him with really any of these players, maybe one. You're going to really have to find some uniqueness if you're combining Connors with any of these other players. But there's a look at a chalky shell. If your fellow contestants are indeed going Rory, I, I, Ryan Moore, um, we'll throw... Uh, what's EVR getting on both of these? EVR, not a whole lot, actually. Uh, Bo Hostler, maybe, who isn't getting a lot per Fantasy National, getting a little bit more attention per Gabe Source. But really, it seems no matter what source you use, they're 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 using maybe a 10K or maybe you know a lower 10 and a and a nine or two nines. They're just living in this Christian Bazadenhut. Whoopsie, I need two A's. Um, you know, Bazadenhut, Rye, Batia, Mitchell area. Uh, 78. Yeah, so I mean, they're just all living in this area right here. We'll throw in Mitchell again. I mean that this is the area of the price board. This upper the upper sevens that are getting dominated. I mean just tons of ownership. So how are we going to maneuver around that? Well, I told you I am not going anywhere really in the eight Ks. If I do, it's Alex Norin. So I'll try to build you a couple of different stars and scrubs lineups because I'm just I'm just not building any balance lineup this this week. If we're gonna do a let's go with a pure like a super stars and scrubs look. Um, that way it'll utilize some of the five or six K plays that I mentioned for you all. This isn't the I've been using the other style of stars and scrubs. Uh, in my uh, or most often in my lineups, but if we're gonna get super greedy, we can go something like Hideki. I, you know, this would be Max Homa for me. We can maybe try to squeeze in a Colin Morikawa with this. And I've mentioned several 6K and 5K plays, or at least a couple of 5Ks. You know, Sam Stevens, um, Dylan Wu. But really, if I'm gonna get super greedy. I've been going to Johnny Vegas at 62 for the bottom of these lineups. Just really like Johnny Vegas at these style of courses. Uh, Vegas. Um, and he, he alone is going to be able to facilitate, you know, not having to go into, you know, the sixes really if you don't want to. Again, you can, you can, use Johnny Vegas with you know this area of the price board and round out your lineup if you wanted uh, but instead let's kind of let's throw in Hoygaard into this uh, only four percent per fantasy national is getting a little bit more attention per game source but you know Hoygaard could be interesting in this um, Lucas Glover Brendan Todd but uh, you know if I'm using Johnny Vegas I'm willing to combine that with another player that is known for his ball striking uh, and just make that a narrative of the lineup. Like it's all going to be the ball striking, a little bit off the tee, um, short game be damned. And then, you know, you're at 8,000 basically per player. Um, you know, I mentioned Aaron Rye. 
because he's on the good half of the draw. He's a little bit more popular, but with the with the uniqueness that you're gaining on Hoy or off of Hoygard and Vegas, you can probably take an Aaron Rye and you know round this out however you wish. Maybe maybe you like a Keith Mitchell, uh, maybe you like an Eric Cole who we haven't really talked about who I don't hate. Uh, Eight thousand is Ricky. I'm just I'm just not there. Uh, maybe it's Seabez. You know, I throw in throw in whoever you might you might want here. I'm gonna go with uh, I'll go with Keith Mitchell. Why not? Yeah, I mean you're still at an eleven percent, and you can easily uh, maneuver some of this money around to not be as popular as this. Like if you come off of Colin Morikawa. Although he is gaining some of your uniqueness, but you know, if you go bring uh, Colin Morikawa down to Max Homa or you know maybe an Alex Noren or Ben on something to that effect, you can you can maneuver your money around here quite easily and probably get under eleven percent. But the lineups that I've been building um, have been you know the kind of triple nine. Triple seven or or two nines and sevens, uh, kind of a, a take on the balance lineup, I guess. I know he's not nine thousand, but I mean he's the lowest priced in the in the ten k. So I've been considering kind of my upper extreme of the nines. Hey, uh, thanks for stopping by, chat P. Much appreciated. Good luck this week. Um, baseball has started, so you'll have to let me know how baseball is going for you as well. Mine has been, I, I I can't match up pitching and hitting. One night I'll have good hitters, and the pitching's been bad. And another night I'll have the right pitchers, and my hitters are dog shit. So, but hopefully things, uh, baseball's been going well for you. Good luck this week with everything Valero. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, but the lineups that I've been building most often, like, I just again, I'm just a big believer in Max Homa. Yes, he's probably going to be the most popular player in the field this week. Don't care. Number one player in my ranks. I'm going to use some Corey Connors. Um, and you see, we don't even have to go into the 6Ks if we, if we don't want. I've been bat bottoming out at like a Sam Ryder. You could also take a look at, you know, a Victor Pari or a Brendan Todd who've been, you know, who rated out pretty well. Hoygaard as well. Glover might be a tad bit too popular if you're going to use Connors, but you know, else otherwise, you know, like Ball Hostler, who I'm just extremely high on again, Aaron Rye. Like, I can use a chalky Aaron Rye, and I'm still not at 10% yet. Um, you know, I, I'd have to be a little bit cautious of using like a Bazayden Hoot with this, or a, or a Mitchell, or a Batia, but you know, I really like Aaron Rye. Let's see. Perhaps for some uniqueness, you could go to Hoygaard. You could go to uh, Eric Cole, again, who we haven't talked about. Not really getting a whole lot of attention. Uh, I don't think this is the best fit for him, but it's not terrible. You see, he's 36th in my rankings. The irons are fine. He's a decent putter on this. But he generally struggles with long courses. So I'm not nearly as high on Eric Cole as as I would be other times. Um, I, I mean, I, I really like Seabez. This is going to be a little bit too chalky, but these are the kind of lineups I've been building. You see, it's almost 12%. I don't like that. I, I wouldn't submit this lineup exact as is, but this is just kind of giving you the shell of what I've been doing. You know, the double nine and then rounding it out in the, in the sevens. Or, you know, Homa Connors... Maybe I drop into the sixes to gain a little bit of uniqueness. Maybe use a Davis Thompson who I didn't talk about, who's you know tenth, you know numerically just by the numbers. I like Davis Thompson uh, a decent amount this week. Andrew Novak uh, at sixty-five. Doug Gim you can always think about as well. Um, let's try. Let's try Davis Thompson. Yeah, I mean, we can go with Bo Hostler, Aaron Rye. I mean, this is 87. This is going to be, again, a little bit more popular, but then you can squeeze in an Alex Norn if you're a believer. So, 
those are the kind of lineups that I've been building the most. You know, trying to combine Homa and Connors, Homa and Spieth maybe, Morikawa and, and Connors, um, maybe a little bit of Ben on, but I've been mainly right in here. I'll use, you know, I might use Fitzpatrick a time or two. I just don't have a good feel for him uh, at this course since he's never played it. But I do like Morikawa this week, especially with the amount of ownership he uh, ownership discount you're getting off the others in the 10Ks. I'll stick around if anybody has any questions um, that you want to you want to answer you want answered for, to finalize your lineups. Um, few answers here on the poll question. Looks like the most common answer has been. Decent amount. So how much are you using players who are already qualified to play the Masters? Uh, decent amount, not avoiding. I'm along the same lines. Uh, that would probably be my answer. It's somewhere between decent amount and a lot. Uh, I'm just not scared to use them at all. Um, it's I'm not really factoring in the Masters at all this week. Maybe that's wrong. To, uh, maybe that's wrong. But that, I, that's where I'm at. I'm just I'm not really factoring it in at all. Beautiful course. Uh, Rogers has the best swing I've seen in person. Hughes is on the radar for fu in the future. Wyndham looked good. Yeah, he he did look good. Even though, even with the scare or the the note that we got about his back, he he looked pretty good last week. Interesting stuff for the Masters coming up next week. But good deal. Glad glad you enjoyed it, Tony. Um, Hopefully, uh, hopefully things worked out well for you down there, um, and and DFS was good and whatnot. Wyndham is a big game hunter so far. Yeah, uh, after his win, the the win at the Wells Fargo and then the U.S. Open, he's been a big game hunter. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Um, <clears throat> my one and done this week. I'm going to be boring again, but I'm going to take Corey Connors. I've missed the cut the past couple of weeks. I've really, really cratered in the one and done standings that uh, that I'm in I could see an argument for Bo Hostler I really could if I wanted to get unique but right now and I'm about 90% sure I'm going to lock in Corey Connors as my one and done for the week um uh, Go over your weather take for the late arrivals. Hey, good, good evening, Gabe. So uh, I was going to mention it in your chat, but yeah, I can I can go over it. Um, I'll bring up um, let me bring up Windfinder here real quick. Um, and I've got a different take than you, at least what you posted on um, what you posted on Twitter, Gabe. Um, Windfinder. So let me pull up. Windfinder very very quickly. San Antonio Airport is there. So, with the forecast that we have, and you you know as well as anybody, uh, Gabe, that you know if you have the the luxury or the ability to to get the most up to date forecast. Uh, to, to do that and whatnot, but based on just what we have here, I'm going to take a different approach than what you mentioned on Twitter. I'm actually looking at a favor of the Thursday morning, preferably the earliest of early Thursday morning and Friday afternoon. The reason being is that I hate the idea of 20 mile an hour differences between sustained winds and gusts. Gusts throw off all of what the player expects. Whereas a player can can adjust for the wind and the gusts, at least by what is forecast, doesn't appear to be too different. But if a player is expecting a an eight mile an hour you know wind or breeze and catches a gust of 30 miles an hour, that shot is going to go nowhere where the player expects. The best example I, I gave earlier in the show was think of the players a couple of years ago. might have been 2021 now. 
And the most vivid image I have is Brooks on 17 takes his tee shot and immediately starts laughing because he catches a gust and that ball didn't get three quarters of the way to the green on 17. Gusts play havoc with players. So I much would prefer the players who are going to have not necessarily the best wind, but the lowest amount of variance between the sustained winds and the gusts. And I could be wrong, but I'm going to be looking at the earliest of early tee times on Thursday, preferably, but it really, really scares me off seeing 15 to 20 mile an hour differences between sustained and gusts. So that's my take on the forecast for you know the cut portion. And then once we get into the weekend, you know, Saturday looks much the same. Now, Sunday looks fantastic. Sunday looks like a great day for uh, championship golf. So I'm going to be factoring in some, you know, some wind performance, uh, you know, on the back end for me. Like if players aren't good in the wind, I'm going to lower them, you know, fairly significantly in my in my consideration. But in terms of a wave stack or or wave advantage, that's where I'm at. Is I am I am trying to. Trying to avoid this. Not necessarily that I like this. It's just I'm trying to avoid this. So hopefully that gives you an idea of where I'm at with that. But I think that's going to be it for the show. I've been going on for quite a while and I still need to jump into, into Gabe's chat, which I will do here momentarily. So if you are not a subscriber to Gabe's article, you are really you really are missing out. Uh, it's a great article. It's a great way to get you prepared for the week at hand. And on Wednesday nights, you're going to be able to join us in his Substack chat as we continue the DFS talk over there, talk about game theory, portions of the price board that we are focusing on, who we like, who we're pivoting to and away from. A lot of great discussion over there. So if you're not a subscriber, I really suggest you go do so. It is free to do, by the way. So thanks to P, Tony, and Gabe for jumping to chat. Much appreciated. Thanks to everyone else out there who tunes in, watches, listens, and supports the channel by liking the videos, commenting, and subscribing. I always appreciate it. Your support uh, means a lot to me. I uh, wouldn't be able to do this without you all. So thank you for that. Um, reminder that my betting card and my top player usage will be out over on X after uh, after a little while tonight. you got to finalize my lineups. And then or, and go into Gabe's chat. Um, so good luck with all of your contests this week. For all of the wagers you have made this week for the Valero Texas Open. For all the DFS contests you play this week for the Valero Texas Open. For this weekend and every weekend, may all your bets be profitable.